Hello and welcome to Beyond Conversation, the intersection of opera and race. I'm John Concepcion, your host for today's conversation. The founder and director of Opera Up Close at Governor State University's Center for Performing Arts and a co-chair of the advisory board here at the center. I've been a professional singer for more than 30 years. And although my work has been primarily in the Chicago area, I've sung all over the country. I knew right away that this is the life I wanted when as a high school student, my music teacher took me to a matinee performance at Lyric Opera. I was encouraged and supported along the way by teachers and family, my friends, my community. My journey from school to stage was often difficult and I worked hard for the jobs I had, but my path was laid out before me and mine for the taking. The transition into a professional career was made less difficult because my teachers looked like me. Most of my colleagues looked like me. The people who hired me gave me stage direction, conducted my music, wrote the music I sang. The people who lit the stage and designed the costumes and changed the scenery between acts. The people who handed me a check, the manager that found me work on my behalf, they all looked like me. I never felt alone or invisible or apart from. That is the unearned, mostly unacknowledged social advantage that I had and continue to have because I'm white. And while there may be many examples of famous black opera singers, some of the great ones of all time, I'm hard pressed to name one black conductor, a black stage director, a black executive director, a black board president, any African-American in a position of power and influence in the operatic world. It took a global pandemic to make the world stop long enough for us to examine ourselves. And it took the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor to make the world get angry enough to say enough. Opera companies and classical music organizations around the country and the world are at a crossroads. Through the lens of everything we know at this time, what does an antiquated white European elitist art form have to say to us in 2020? How will we react? How will we listen? How will we change? It's precisely for these reasons that I've assembled a panel of Chicago's top tier black opera professionals whose, na whose uh, narrative will drive today's conversation. I'm here to moderate, to keep everyone on topic and watch the clock. There's a lot to discuss and a lot of opinions on this virtual stage. So let me just take a moment and introduce you to all of my guests. Mezzo-soprano Leah Dexter, a native of Detroit, Michigan, has sung with opera companies, orchestras, and musical festivals around the country and throughout Europe. Locally, she regularly performs with South Shore Opera, Lyric Opera, uh, Lyric and Limited, Chicago Opera Theater, among many others. You may have seen uh, recently, as I did, her performance with Chicago Opera Theater in their streamed world premiere performance of The Transformation of Jane Doe by Chicago composer Stacey Garrett. Adrian Dunn is an accomplished singer, songwriter, and producer. He is a MacArthur Grant recipient for his original work, Hopra, a hip hop opera, which he performed here on our stage last season, is a highly sought after presenter and lecturer, the founder of Black Music Matters, and the founder and musical director of the Adrian Dunn Singers, who recently released an album titled Revelations, a collection of spirituals and gospel songs in seeking justice for Black lives. Originally from Florida, tenor Camillo Humes has sung extensively throughout the country. He made his La Scala debut in Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. He recorded and performed the title role in Richard Thompson's opera, The Mask in the Mirror, based on the life of American poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Camillo is currently a full-time member of the Lyric Opera Chorus. Soprano Joelle Lamar is an artist of extraordinary range and scope. She's appeared in Chicago Opera Theater's world premiere production of Dan Shore's opera, Freedom Ride, portrayed Sister Rose in the Chicago premieres of Jack Hagee's opera, Dead Man Walking, 
has performed roles ranging from Cho Cho San in Madame Butterfly to Hattie in Kiss Me Kate to the title role in, in Keru Okoye's opera, Harriet Tubman, When I Crossed That Line to Freedom. Bill McMurray, baritone, is a favorite to Chicago audiences. With Chicago Opera Theater, he has sung roles in Iolanta, the Midwest premiere of The Scarlet Ibis, and Elizabeth Cree. He's also appeared extensively around the country on both the concert and operatic stages, most recently with the Northwest Indiana Symphony's Beethoven Ninth and the University of Chicago's presentation of Michael Tippett's A Child of Our Time. Bass baritone John Ordunia is a singing actor of great versatility. His repertoire spans sacred oratorios to comic roles. He made his debut with Washington National Opera and has sung with orchestras in Indianapolis, Richmond, Cincinnati, and right here in Chicago, of course. A couple summers ago, he was the featured soloist with the Grant Park Symphony's Salute to Independence Day broadcast live on National Public Radio. And finally, very baritone Vince Wallace. A native of St. Louis, Vince is familiar to audiences in Chicago from his appearances with Chicago Opera Theater's productions of The Consul, Elizabeth Cree, Moby Dick, and Freedom Ride. He sings regularly with most of Chicago's premier music organizations, including the Chicago Symphony, Grant Park Music Festival, and Lyric Opera of Chicago. And he's sung roles with companies across the country, including Opera Philadelphia, Utah Festival Opera, and the San Francisco Opera. So please welcome all my guests today, and thank you all for being a part of this important conversation today. I really appreciate it. I think it's important to start off by understanding the situation of racial equity, whatever that means, as it pertains to our industry and perhaps how we got here. Adrian, I'd like to start with you. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience, what you know from your perspective? Just talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here with my other Black brothers and sisters uh, on this panel. So um, I just want to give respect and love to everyone on the panel, first of all. Um, secondly, what I was going to say was the issue, as I see it, um, in the opera industry or in the broader classical industry as well, uh, is one that none of us started or had anything to do with personally, something that happened over 400 years ago and in this country. Um, and I believe that much of the, the things that we are dealing with in terms of race in the industry is we are all living in the aftermath um, or continuing to live. It's something that really isn't the aftermath. It's a continuation, if we're honest, because we're still talking about the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the Laquan McDonald's and the list goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on because one day, maybe my name would be on that list unfortunately, because I am a black man in the world. And I believe that the opera industry for too long have neglected the contributions of black composers, black opera composers, for too long have neglected the contributions of black opera singers. Yes, we know about Kathleen Battle, we know about Leontine Price, uh, we know, some of us know about George Shirley, but there's a long list of other amazing black opera singers that many times are not uplifted, right? And so I think that it's so much or so important that we not just talk about representation on the stage, but we also talk about representation in the boardroom, that we talk about the business of opera. We have to talk about things like unionizing. We have to talk about um, things like, where is the money going? Why is it that we have in a city like Chicago, um, we have executive directors and artistic directors that are making $1.8 million when the average black income, right, in the city of Chicago is oftentimes less than $50,000 based on where you are living in this city. It's unfair. And I feel like um, a lot of the problem is complex and there's many different levels to it. Uh, but I also want to let my colleagues get in and chime in um, as well. And so thank you for having me. Vince, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience, uh, things that you have uh, been a part of, things that you've witnessed, uh, maybe from your own personal perspective about how that has affected you in, in any ways. Um, again, thank you for uh, for 
letting me join this panel on this uh, important topic, especially in these times, John. Um, hello to all of my colleagues. It's good to see you all since we can't do it you know, in person. Uh, being from St. Louis and the pedigree that I had before I had gotten to Chicago, uh, personally, I felt uh, was at my was to my advantage to where I ended up with uh, with my success and my professional career in Chicago. Um, I went to Eastman School of Music uh, for my undergrad, which is a very di diverse uh, conservatory, and then after that, I also went to Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, which is again a, another very diverse. Um, um, institution. And I was always surrounded by people that were not my color. Um, I also was raised in a predominantly uh, Catholic uh, environment in St. Louis. So I went to an all Catholic uh, school where I was the only fly in the flower, you know, most of my life, whether it was, you know, the only black kid in the class, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the football field, the, the marching band, the, this or that. I was always the first black to do this in whatever institution all the way until uh, until I got to college. Um, but like I said, with with my the pedigree that I have and being placed in Chicago, uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, of being of working of working with all of you, um, tons of people that necessarily don't look like me. But I also it's always in the back of my mind that we are a minority in everything. Um, Today, now we see more, and in pre-COVID, we see a lot more of us on stage, which is fantastic. But I think uh, it would be even better, as John pointed out earlier, that we need to see more of us in those deciding, in those decision rooms, in those in those panels, on those boards, um, because we're kind of tired of having someone not look like us tell us how to be us on stage, and. Uh, it, it it puts a it puts a it puts a a blockade between the art and the person when you don't have uh, that connectivity um, with one another. Um, so composers uh, are around, just like black singers are around. We just need to find a way to get them uh, noticed and 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 put out there. Then the same with directors and board members. There are tons of uh, there are tons of people that look like me that want those positions. And I think that that would be the best way to go from where we have been to where we want to be, which is just represented across the board uh, with, you know, just across the board, period. So thanks again. I kind of feel like we have to remember, like, the root cause of even having this conversation is understanding systematic racism. Like, the root cause is racism, right? So the system is based on racism, like it, it is created to perpetuate racism. The way the board meets, the way things are run, like that is what is happening. And so this, this is not something that can be rectified in like a year. You know, this is, these are steps, right? But we have to recognize, I think we have to acknowledge what we're talking about. Like we are talking about racism and how it's perpetuated in an establishment where we work um, and how it's designed for power and money to stay where it is. And um, the game is designed for black people to lose. Like that's just how the system is set up. You know, it may be hard to hear, but that's how it, that's how it's set up. It's that way. It's that way outside the opera house too. Of course. Of course. I mean, this this is from what I'm talking about. It just so happens that we're all in the same field, and we're all talking like we're we're kind of narrowing in the focus and like really looking in and just trying to figure out uh, well how does this apply to me? What can we do in our field? to make sure that we're recognized. And I think that's one of the things that Adrian Dunn has always tried to, like every conversation we've had has always been that. I've talked to John. John is probably the most um, gifted in speech that I've ever <laughs> met. Like he's so eloquent when he speaks about stuff like this, you know? So, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Go ahead. Sure, I mean, I'll say this. I mean. One of the things I, you know, I have, I'd like to have notes to gather my thoughts because my brain can just run. So one of the things I wrote down was 
these arts organizations exist in the world that we live in. So yes, this is a broader topic, and we all grow up with all of the different things that we have been told were good, were uh, monikers of success, monikers of uh, being cultured, monica uh, monikers of culture, right? So this isn't all that dissimilar from regular life. I would say one of the things that has been particularly frustrating is that I have had a number of these conversations, and as powerful and informative as they are, none of the people that I work for have been involved with these conversations. None of the people who make the decisions for these organizations pop in, ask to hold things in a public forum. We've had a number of organizations from educational institutions to orchestras. I think the American League of Orchestras has done a number of things. We've had very specific statements people have put out, which are great because those are concrete things we can hold people to. But what we haven't had are the people who run these organizations saying, this is a problem for the organization. So what happens is these conversations happen with us and our friends, right? And that's more or less where they say, we're very good at getting started. The question is, what's the follow through? So this will not happen in a year, no. But there are tangible things that can happen in a month, in two months. There are deadlines that can actually happen in terms of having open forums, having people be clear that the organization will make this their issue, that they will put their money, their people, their time, their location behind these things. Otherwise, I feel like I'm asking an organization to fix a problem for me when I don't trust them with the problem. So as beautiful as my career has been and as varied as it's been, I still frequently in Chicago find myself being one of, if not the only Black person on stage. And that includes crew, that includes all of the different spaces. And it's odd to me, not just because of the breadth of talent, but because of how diverse you know, we tend to think we are. And so I think there are just tangible ways that we can get clear about this and just say, this is a problem for blank organizations. I want to get this resolved. I'm going to put some money behind this and stop the professional volunteerism that is frequently asked of, of us, um, you know, in serving on diversity councils, diversity boards, et cetera. And we need to basically use, a, I'm gonna use a borrowed term from my Oberlin friends, we're going to decolonize our thinking around this. We need to think about how we can incorporate these things into our everyday goings on, because the things that we do every day define the things that we do every day, <laughs> right? To piggyback off of you know what John and Joelle were saying, I think we have to remember that racism is inherently built into the fabric, specifically of this country. Uh, so it's no wonder that it would also bleed into the artistic community and into the opera industry itself, right? And um, I think we have to move away from organizations and institutions that are you know, putting out these, these wonderful mission statements and solidarity posts and move from going from that to actually taking active steps to correct and dismantle um, this, the current system. Because in my view, that's the only way that effective change is going to be made is to actually restructure and reorganize the system as it is. And I think that's a point that a lot of people kind of, you know, they miss. Um, and John also had a point about, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, we care about diversity, we care about these matters, but the proof is actually in the pudding, right? With the budget. That's, I mean, budgets are all about priorities as well, right? Um, so we need to see if that is, if diversity and inclusion and equity is indeed a priority for an organization, it should also line up with their budget, with their strategic initiatives, with their partnerships, um, developing their audience, um, broadening their audience, you know, being involved with uh, and engaging the Black community, whether it's through faith leaders, um, fundraisers, community organizers, you name it. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's more about, okay, like John was saying, we know what the issues are now, what are we doing going forward? Leah. Hi. Um, yeah, and 
you know, ex expand. I agree with everything that everybody has said so far. And, you know, to be quite frank, opera is largely known as an entity for old, white, rich people. And I think that's where the departure has to be made and it has to be more inclusive. And it's, and it's, and it's, it always has this idea of being this upper class, unattainable sort of art form where that's not the case at all. It's not. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a discussion with a gentleman that works for an organization who I won't name and he reached out to me to discuss how to be more inclusive and diverse within this organization, which their main, um, their main purpose is to provide funding for new composers to develop new works. And so I asked him, I said, okay, have you ever given funding to a black composer? No is are there any black people professionals that are on your board no so why is that and why is it that there are so many african-american singers and composers and conductors and and you know whoever else that run the gamut that have been around since Mozart's time and before that nobody seems to know about. And I'm gonna say it, the, oh, the, the, the most well-known the, that everybody wants to do is Porgy and Bess. That is not the end all be all of, okay, well, I guess that's how we're gonna get the black singers in to, or on, on the stage. There, there is, there's just a lot of work to do in terms of why is it that whenever, okay, a light bulb goes off, we need to be more inclusive and diverse within our organization. Why is it that your crutch is you have to go and talk to a black person about that? Take the initiative and do some research, learn something, learn about these other composers. Who are these black singers who are out here singing? Where are they? What have they done? Who are they connected with? Who, who are these you know, black conductors who are conducting these major orchestras? What are, you know, what are they doing? Like you have to take the initiative to, you know, to open things up for yourself. You can't always have someone else tell you what to do and how to do it. Like we're all adults and we're grown. Like figure it out. Yes, like us as black professionals and black singers, we are here to offer advice and you know to be to be open and to give suggestions, but we cannot do all the work. The companies and these people who run these companies, you know, as as I just said, they just you you gotta have this momentum. You gotta put more energy into this. You cannot just rely on, okay, it's been four years, so let's do Porgy and Bess again. That doesn't work and it hasn't worked. I agree with Leah. Um, there's this sense of, you know, that's the whole tokenism, right? Like you, there are professional EDI, like, or is it, is it EDI consultants um, or D, DEI, whatever, however you um, want to put it, um, consultants who train for this, like a one black person that's on your staff, that's too much pressure. Yeah, they may have some thoughts, but get someone who's trained, get one of your um, donors to pay so that they can pay for this person to work for you. You know, I was literally listening to a call yesterday um, where there were like th two, two EDI professionals who basically said, do not do tokenism. Do not look to your administrator, administrative personnel to be that token person to go to, to ask for, uh, what do you think we should do? That's not fair. That's not fair on them and it's too much pressure. 
and it's also not thorough enough, right? So the the, the issue is, the, well, another issue I should say is that if you make that, so Leah mentioned that, you know, let's do Porgy and Beth, that's how we'll get the Black singers. Unfortunately, that's also how they get rid of them. Because when that show leaves, they leave as well. And I say this as somebody who has never done a Porgy and Beth, <laughs> and I, I realized it took me a long time. To, you know, I, I, I don't know any of these people. And there are people who have made full living off of just that piece alone because, you know, that's where they can get stuff done. And let me be clear. I don't say any of this to take away from any of the work they've done or for any of the power of that piece, um, both as a tool and as a piece of art, because um, I think it can be both, frankly. But I will say, if you bring people in just for these specific points, that doesn't include them in the things that are going on. This is where talking about inclusion and representation and having people involved in the lifeblood of your company will remove the tokenism aspect. I shouldn't be brought in to be a specialist or to talk about this one thing. Let's do it all. You know, we these folks are singing. They come with full resumes. They do all the things. You know, and I think people, they do all the things. They know all the songs. I mean, <laughs> we sing them. It's fine. It's lovely and all. But I, but I, I just felt compelled to say that because I think that's something I want more people to hear is that yes, Porgy and Best will bring black singers into your company, but if that's the only way you brought them in, that was exactly how you'll get rid of them. And that's how you will lose them and how they will not remain as a part of your organization. And to piggyback off of what you're saying, John, I agree. Um, because I remember when I was first putting myself out there as a professional singer, and even slightly before that, it was always hearing about Porgy and Bess, and that was your way into an opera company, and that was just, that was your best way. If they were doing that production, then you would get an opportunity to sing for that company, they would hear your voice, see how well you work, and then you would just hope that they would bring you back. And of course, as a young singer, when you're hungry and you want that work, and you'll take whatever you can get, and you do that production for you invest, and you get great reviews, the company likes you, things like that, and then you never hear from that company again. And you're wondering, well, not only can I sing this role in Porgy and Bess, but I can sing Count Almaviva in, you know, Nazi di Figaro. I can sing Sharpless in Butterfly. And, you know, you just want that opportunity to be heard for those roles, and you're not even getting that chance. And you now have a history with that company where they know your work ethic, they know what you're capable of, but they're not even considering you for these other roles. So you're right. It's a great way to bring them in, but it's also a way to lose them. And I just want to say, since people are, are listening, it's not that we're, you know, disparaging Porgy and Bess. It's a great work. It's a fantastic piece. And, you know, you do it if you can. And as you said, many people have made their careers off of singing just Porgy and Bess. You know, I was told very early, it's like, you don't want to get caught in that trap, you know, because I did one when I was in grad school. And then I had another opportunity to do one. It didn't pan out. And then somebody offered me one. I was like, no, I don't want to get you know, we call it, as you all know, it's that Porgy and Best trap where that's all they see you for. And they don't see you for the variety that you can offer. There's nothing wrong with that. Like there, it's like, um, the thing about it is, it's like when you listen to Porgy and Best, there are a lot of Jewish references. So here it is, we have this white man. I mean, he's white, as far as I'm concerned. Because when he walks into a room, you don't say immediately, this guy's Jewish. You know, when I walk in a room, I'm black, you know what I'm saying? So here it is that you have Porgy and Bess and there's a lot of Jewish references in the music. This is a story that he, you know, I, I think Naomi uh, Andre, she wrote it very well in her book where she basically was like, he almost told the story of his immigrated Russian family who came over. You know, when you listen to the music, there's certain things that you hear and, um, and it's beautiful music. You know what I'm saying? It's beautiful music, um, but we have to remember, this is like one of the things that Adrian has mentioned. It's like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's great music, but there's a little bit of minstrel, the sambo, you know, of Porgy, you know, minstrelism in there. Uh, and it that's what that time was. You know what I'm saying? I think picking up on um, what Joelle was saying with Porgy, I think many of us, most of us have done Porgy and Bess. Um, many of the artists who sing Porgy and Bess, there's sort of a love-hate relationship with it, right? Because on the one hand, it creates and opens up so many opportunities 
for us as performers, the music is glorious, right? But on the other hand, it is our story and our experiences being told through the lens of whiteness, essentially, right? And then you have the other side of it, which is the, the exploitation um, of these companies that hire the singers to perform these roles. And then, like Bill was saying, then you, you, you never hired again to do anything else to the point that many principal artists, when they are engaged um, for these roles, for Porgy and Beth, a lot of times what you'll hear them do is negotiate, okay, well, I'll come and sing uh, Serena, but you have to hire me to do, you know, um, Leonora, do some other role, right? Because they don't want to be put in that box. Um, so it's not that Porgy and Bess is not a great work. It is it's splendid. Um, many of us, we regularly sing. I think I've done a Porgy and Bess with most of us on here, right? But it's just rem important to remember those two things uh, regarding that specific work. Adrian, jump in there. Would you? I know you've got something you want to say there. Yeah, I also think that it's important to embrace this idea that we as Black folks are not a monolith. We have many different perspectives. We have many different opinions and we can still love each other at the end of that. Um, that that just because one of us has done a porgy and one has not, doesn't mean that there's a, any differential, right? But I also think that we're missing a bit of the picture that I want to invoke right now around Black composers, which is the fact that George Gershwin was not Black. And I want to talk about what in today's terms we would call appropriation that the reality is, is that back then we didn't have terms like appropriation or, 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 or one race giving a portrayal of another race. And the reality is that the history of American musical theater is one that is born in minstrelsy, is one that is born in something that is the original sin of this country, slavery. And if we are not in a place to be able to say that while I can appreciate George Gershwin's work or the work that he put on this page, black folks are the authors of American music, unequivocally. The reality is, is that him going to South Carolina, if we follow the, the written history, and my favorite thing to say is also that Maya Angelou told us a long time ago that you can write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies, but the reality is eventually the truth will still be the truth. The truth is it's borrowed. And at, borrowed is kind. What I'm saying is you stole it. I'm saying you stole it. And I'm saying that in 2020, we're coming for our stuff. What I'm saying is, is that it is not enough to continue the narrative of performative justice. You can keep your statement. You can keep all of that. And you can make more. That's okay. But again, without substantive action about not just talking about how we move forward. We can't move forward until we really unpack the problem. And the problem here is something that is really deep, dark, and ugly, which is that we've had Black people writing operas for hundreds of years. We have had these things being robbed from us ever since we got here. There is no such thing as the American musical or American opera without talking about Black people, because it's ours. You don't have to include us because we created it. And so what I'm saying is, is that whether or not we got the credit for it, is a different story. And I think that that framework is very important to embrace, that when I say that Black folks are the authors of the Ameri of American music and that every genre comes through the slave field that we call popular music or even American classical music, it's about making sure that we give the respect, the honor to the ancestors that we all stand on their shoulders and the people who came before us. And, and let me say this regarding Black composers. You know, I'm sure we probably all know that the Met is finally going to do their first ever Black opera next year, Terry Blanchard's opera. Um, you know, why, why, why is it taking, yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, why, is it, why is it taking this long? William Brent still has nine operas, nine. And one of them is a grand opera and it's good. I'm talking about Troubled Island. Why is that not been on an international stage? Because it goes to what you're saying as well. Because because you have these black composers, a lot of them are writing about what black culture. 
they've taken everything else away from us. They've taken our music, they've taken our identity, they've taken our culture, they've taken our language. And, they've in, and, and when I say they, I do mean white America. And they've ingratiated into their own culture, but they don't want to give us the credit. So to see a black opera on the stage prior to whatever what the Met is going to do would only mean that now they're only promoting black people and black culture. So that within itself raises all sorts of issues. And why that didn't happen before now, I don't know. Whether or not the Met will, you know, successfully do this, which uh, apparently they are, because they're even going to have the first black stage directors. Uh, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but she's stage directing, which will also be, you know, one of those big moments in history. But why does it have to be the Metropolitan Opera that has to be this just this this entity that has to be the first to do it? There have been plenty of black composers that have written black operas that could have been produced at any time. Again, I, I've had this conversation. I think the reason is because they don't want to see black culture on an international stage other than in the minstrelsy of Corgi and Bess. You know, I think too is that the uh, when you look to the Met for leadership, the Met to me is like such a, a separate entity. You know, the opera is so much bigger than just the Metropolitan Opera. And I think a lot of the real change is going to come with regional opera. The smaller opera companies have the capacity and the ability to do these operas that nobody knows, that the white America doesn't know. And, and I remember, Adrian, you and I had a talk once about uh, many things, and your answer stuck with me. I posed a bunch of questions to you, and, the, and all you said was money. Can you talk a little bit about the direction of money, where it comes from, uh, where it goes, and maybe... Do you think that that will instigate a real change in the way opera companies are formed and who writes and who performs is is because everything starts with the money? Yeah, it starts and it ends right with the and oftentimes, like we are seeing in our national politics, when you follow the money, you get to the truth of your priorities. When you follow the money, you get to the actual truth about the role that race plays in denigrating who we are and continuing, again, present progressively, continuing to steal our stuff. And, and where I'm going here is, is that when we have systems and grant systems that reward organizations for having little black boys and little black girls in the education programs, but won't eventually put those same black people on the stage, we have a conflict of priority. And you can't be about the people and paying your artistic director $1.8 million and your executive director $800,000 when the average median black income in the city of Chicago, in certain areas of Chicago for sure, is certainly uh, less than $50,000, oftentimes with multiple children, multiple uh bills to pay and things of that nature. And so where I'm going is, is that the money, there is racism in philanthropy. And if we don't talk about the racism in philanthropy, which oftentimes is where the money comes from, old, rich folks, I think is what Leah said earlier. If we don't get to the core of that, and if we don't get to the core of racism in philanthropy in our larger organizations, or why we have Black companies like South Shore Opera, like Opera Ebony. And why does this company have $238 million worth of endowment, but the Black companies oftentimes can't even get a $10,000 grant from those same organizations? So is it are we really surprised when we have these priorities in our budgets when that don't reflect the communities that we serve? Of course, there won't be black people there. And oftentimes, I, I hope that the business part of investing in black businesses, much like Black Music Experience streaming service that we're launching this month with the Black Music Matter Summit, excuse me, that people go to support black owned businesses because black folks will always be the priority. And again, I think someone said it earlier that, you know, I, so in my other life, I do project accounts managing for, um, a bunch of different companies. <laughs> and one of the things that you learn is that in corporate budgeting, they're not about money. They're about the values of the organization. And I've seen, you know, um, large opera companies. I mean, you know, even when Lyric did the ring cycle, that is a huge fiscal investment. That is a lot of money. And it's a lot of money for a while because it takes time to plan 
we did, a, I got the chance to do La Troyenne, which is a phenomenal piece of music, but it's not done because it's enormous and it takes so much and it takes so much money. And so, you know, we're not doing Troyenne on a four-year cycle. That ain't happening. Okay, You're going to do that once, in, twice in a career, maybe, and that'll be fine. But if it's what you want to do, do what I do here at the house. If I want another plant, I stack up my little coin in a very specific envelope. And I say, this is my plant envelope. This is what I want to do. If I run an opera company, and I say, I want to have some black operas run through here. I want to commission new things. I will take my little envelope for black opera and stack it up. You know, we can do what we want to do because we do what we want to do. It's, it's no different than any other job. People want to work with the people they want to work with. They want to do the things that they want to do. And I think, again, this is where, you know, my question becomes, is, is, is the absence of these things, is it a problem for the people who make the decisions? Is it a problem for the people who go and ask money? Is it a problem for the people that come up with the program? And it seems to me so far the answer is no. I've, yeah, I just can't find a really affirmative statement in this from anybody about whether or not this is a big enough issue to really start to incorporate this into the regular decisions that we make and to reaching out. Because philanthropy, in fact, is rather racist and it is very segregated. But, you know, there, I want to be very clear. Just like we talked about Black people are not a monolith, all Black people ain't poor either. There is plenty of good Black money around. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, quiet as it's loudly kept, they know where it is because they're there too. They come to the shows. We see them, and they're, you know, bedazzled and bedecked, <laughs> you know, for all of the shows, and it's lovely. And I think, you know, it, it, we don't necessarily even have to reinvent the wheel here. We just got to change course. And like I said, I just, if, if they decide that this is what they want to do, you take the way you ask for money and you ask some other people. You go to other events. And like I said, the follow through, because it's true, you know, we do have a lot of youth. And then we see that all over the place. And then we don't track them. We don't know where they go. We don't know where their music careers are, their education. They don't show up as adults, either in the audiences or on stage. And I think that that's, you know, a real problem here. And so it, 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 so it is. It starts and ends with the money because it's an investment that, you know, we have to make. And I think it's well worth it when it, if, well, when and if it actually ends up happening. The, uh, I'm sorry, Joel, do you want to say something? Jump in. No, I was just going to um, say that this kind of goes into where you wanted us to lead into, like, what are the solutions? Yeah. You know, and um, I thought that that is one of the things that I wrote down, like, the company needs to be able to rebuild their dream, right? The, the, and they need to be able to know that when I, earlier when I said that this is going to be a process, this is going to take years, you have to be able to, um, yes, you have to stop taking money from, you know, venture capitalists uh, who uh, strings, who basically build on metrics. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, um, the humanity part, because again, this is the problem is racism. What racism, racism is based on, I'm human. I am a human being. I need you to treat me accordingly, right? I'm not asking for anything that's, that's, you know, that I'm standing out on. So one of the solutions is to stop taking money from, from people who um, are just in it for the money. And when you, you need to also really just start looking at your company and really look, taking uh, count of what it is that you have, proper resources, What are, um, you need to either, if you have make passing resolutions on the board, um, how specific, you know, how specific can you be in naming those resolutions? Like um, understanding like uh, Black Opera Alliance put out a letter and like there was this Timothy O'Leary and Steve Osgood and Jean Kellogg from Marola, like they were all on this thing last night and they were asking questions on like, how do we implement? Cause there were two uh, professionals, like I said, and they were like, this is this letter is not asking for anything that, uh, you know, that you can't give. Um, and 
I think they also kind of put one of them in place was just like, this isn't a check box. Just because you can look at this letter, you, you, this is not about, okay, putting these points in some document. You know, this is about making true change, really accepting um, and understanding that inclusion means that you're gonna have to give up a little bit of power. You're gonna have to go to people like Adrian and at, talk to people like, like John and, and Bill and Leah and really ask what that means to, to uh, have quality work from people uh, who are composed. I, I'm, a, I'm a playwright, you know what I'm saying? Like I've, I've coined myself as a playwright. Um, so, so is that what you mean? Is, is, so when we talk about organizational accountability, yeah, uh, you know, is putting uh, putting uh, black uh, entrepreneurs, black administrators, in the middle of these organizations and not just on the stage. Yes, but yeah. all around the, the pipeline, yeah. so that there's, it's infused with uh, that whole new perspective. Yeah, you want to require the administrative staff or orchestra members, independent contractors, you know, um, conductors. Um, stage crew, everything like that, where it's like they, you know, when you involve these, all these different people, you start to, this is the diversity, not just diversity in who, what color are the different faces in the room, but a diversity of thought um, and understanding that the only way that you're going to have a sustainable solution is to also understand that, you know, equity equity I put is, is the quality of being fair, unbiased and just, you know what I'm saying? Not, it's the difference between equity and equality, mm. you know what I'm saying? And understanding at, and inclusion is, it's more about failing, you know what I'm saying? It's more, like I said, it's more about giving up that power, you know, right. it really trusting that when you call on Leah, when you call on Adrian, he's going to have some ideas that don't match with yours and that's okay. And that it's also necessary and needed because I think that you know, I said in an interview I did not too long ago that a lot of the racism I experience in my vocal, in my singing workplaces is a lot of blind spots. You know, I'm not talking about the crazy stuff that we're seeing with khaki pants and tiki torches running down the street here. You know, we're, we're talking about people who have blind spots with these things. And that for me is the real value of diversity. Because see, as a person who's put into the diversity, diversity doesn't benefit me. I'm here doing all this work. I'm not being paid for it. The, you know, there's nothing from whiteness I need to do my things because there's nothing certainly that I've been given. But I think the point is that we have all of these different viewpoints and we can cover each other's blind spots. And by having that equity and having all these different points in here, we can get a clearer picture. And I think that for me is really what's important about having people in all the places. I mean, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, you know, women should be in all the places where the decisions are being made. I would say the same thing for black people when it comes to opera, if that's what you want to do. If it's actually a problem for your organization, then where should black people be? Wherever you have things going on, in ticketing, in the chorus, in the union, in the front of house, in the orchestra, wherever. Just have them around because again we do all the things all the things another thing that companies can do they need to start holding um agents and managers accountable you know i look through um some management companies and some you know agents last night and out of 10 that i looked through each one maybe had one black soprano everybody else was was either European from another country. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I know for sure, just by singing and the lyric opera chorus, just a little bit, that there are some talented singers in Chicago, just in Chicago, who will blow the socks off and blow your socks. I mean, John, you're a fantastic singer. Why haven't you sung a major role? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, I'm just saying, there's a lot of talent here in Chicago. We don't necessarily have to, you know, managers need to really pan up and basically 
expand their rosters to represent um, what's who's out there. The truth is for the managers, they want to have that one token. They need to have that token black singer or two, you know, whether it's a soprano and a baritone or a tenor or whatever, so they can fill the corgi and bass requirement or the Aida requirement, um, you know, or something of that nature. What I will say uh, to uh, segue a little bit in terms of uh, the changes that were needed and companies that are making changes, one of the things or two that I will speak for, one is Chicago Symphony Orchestra that actually has a Black alliance with Sheila Ann Dawson, who has an ear um, in, in, in the heads of people like Maisha Muti and, and other people. And they do have specific programs that have reached out to underprivileged children. They definitely move out into minority communities. So I do give them credit for that. Still, not anybody of African-American sitting on the board or in administration, things like that. That's something that needs to be looked into. But another company that I will um, advocate for is definitely Chicago Opera Theater. Um, how interesting that both the general director, the music director, and the artistic director are all women. So you have a company that is being run specifically by women. And since they have taken over, you've seen an incredible change in the diversity of cast. And one thing that has always bothered me in opera, and I'm sure we can all attest to this, is that when you have um, people in the leading roles, they are typically usually of the same race. And uh, I'll, pick, I'll, I'll go back in history by saying, you know, if you are a black lyric tenor, um, the chances of you being on stage in a heroic role with a white lyric soprano were slim and not. Uh, it just didn't happen. Has that changed a little bit? Obviously so, because you have singers like Larry Brownlee and Russell Thomas, whose talent they cannot deny and they have to put them on stage. But when you look at somebody like Chicago Opera Theory now, you know, I'm singing roles in Russian. You know, how many black Russians do you know? But that suspension of disbelief, they're willing to give that to you. You've got, you know, and when I did um, uh, the Scarlet Ibis, my wife was, was Caucasian. It, did, it was not, that fact was not missed on me the second I walked into the first rehearsal, but it was never brought up. It was never an issue. All they saw were two singers that were qualified to do this job. So I commend companies like that, that are looking beyond just your color and hiring you on the basis of your talent and your availability. And yet still the big opera companies in Chicago, Chicago Opera Theater included, have maybe one person working in behind the scenes in the administration who is black. And Lyric Opera has two, and there are 35 major positions. Vince, why don't you talk a little bit about regional opera, when you do regional opera, what your experiences are. We've, we've got a few minutes left. I wanna to get to Vince and Camille, and I want Leah a chance to speak as well. Um, thank you, John. In, in working with the smaller companies, you know, in the Chicagoland area, uh, like Bill said, I, I, I've been with COT for, a number of years at this point, and we literally just had a forum uh, discussion like this last week, uh, trying to decide uh, what we can do, how we can make uh, make this the shift into into it, it being inclusive. And Chicago Opera Theater is absolutely one of those uh, that that is is doing the right thing. They're including, um, and I and I. I don't want to say they're doing the right thing because they're all women, but it goes back to the Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote that women need to be minorities need to be in these positions so that we can get other minorities in more positions. Like it, it keeps going. White people have money to do white people things. And that's why white people are doing them. If there are, if, if you find the black people or if you find the minorities that, that have the resources and the, 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 the dedication and 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 the want to provide, and they are capable in these positions. And why not have them? Why not have them there? Um, like I said, like I said before, with with all the work that I've done in Chicago, I do not. It is not lost on me that I'm the black guy. Like when you need a Balthazar, who are you going to call? When you need, you know, this or that. Um, I'm grateful for one, but also um, at this point in the game people know that we all can do more than just pouring your best. I mean, I've, I've worked with all of you a, a ton and this is not just a, a, a menstrual game. We are classically trained and, I, and, and can sing incredibly well in a lot of different genres. Um, and I think that the regional companies uh, really are going to be like John said, the first, like that's where it has to start. It has to start in the smaller houses so that people know that it can be done. 
And once they see that it can be done, like COT is doing, like um, Haymarket has has offered me a few things. That, I mean, the, the, the smaller the smaller houses, uh, and there's so many in Chicago, and obviously they're they're everywhere. But I really think that if the smaller houses show that it can be done, then the greedier, bigger houses are going to get on board and be like, oh, we can do this too. It seemed to have worked for COT. It seemed to have worked for you know, Haymarket. It seemed to have worked for not even just opera, but also with small um, chamber groups, Lakeside Singers, Bella Voce. These people come from all over the place and they come together because Chicago is a melting pot, especially for, for music and and art and high art that we can, I, I just think it has to start there. Um, and it has to start from, uh, from the board, from, the, from, from within. Right, Leah, I want to. I know we had some connectivity issues with you. I want you to give you a chance to jump in here and say a couple of things. We only have a couple minutes left. What, uh, what, what do you think? What does, what does uh, organizational accountability or equity on the, in the opera industry, what does that look like to you from your perspective? I are black people. Plain and simple. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and not and not just black singers. Right. Hire them behind the scenes in the office. And you know, and I think it was Adrian that mentioned this earlier, in, in the ticket office, in the in in production, in you know, in the artistic administration. We are just as capable and committed and passionate and happy to be involved with this art form. And also I think companies need to realize that these younger generations are interested in other cultures. They're interested to learn more about not just black culture, but Middle Eastern, Asia, whatever it may be. And they want to see different types of shows other than just oh okay the marriage of figaro which is fine it's a fantastic opera but there's so many more different more innovative special you know wonderful types of shows and productions and operas that could be put on the stage for audiences to experience right and i think whole wealth of repertoire that we don't know yes exactly and and then that that begs the question why don't we know right why, why are know? why are these things not being done and now is the time i mean why not just right. do it just jump in and do it i have just a couple minutes left i want to jump to camille i want to ask you uh if if you if you want to have something to say but i also want to say in a couple words what do you think action what's the action that needs to happen at this point, going beyond the conversation that we're all used to having? I think first, and, and, and as basic as this is gonna sound, the first action is acknowledgement, right? It's acknowledging the fact that systemic racism exists, it's real, and it's built into the fabric of our society, so therefore it's inherently also in the arts as well, right? I think the problem we run into sometimes with uh, managers of companies is that you know, they focus on patting themselves on the back and centering themselves with regards to what they are doing, what they think they're doing to come to combat racism and diversity. And I think there needs to be more focus on actively commissioning operas by Black composers, right? Um, creating mentorships and partnerships, uh, supporting the strategic initiatives of comp of organizations like you know. Um, the National Association of Negro Musicians and Black Opera Alliance and Black Music Matters, um, creating partnerships, really, you know, just acknowledging the problem and moving from mission statements and posts of solidarity to actually actively uh, creating change. Doing something, okay. exactly. Not just putting out a statement. Exactly. I wanted to just also say, too, it's a little point, is to don't be afraid. The work is going to be hard. It's not going to feel good. You're going to have cultural barriers that you're going to have to work through. Um, you're going to have psychological safety issues that you're going to have to work through. Um, and you need to make sure that you hire professionals who know what those things are, who have strategic plans, and that's it. Right. I agree. And Adrian, I'm going to give you the last word here. Jump in and just Give me your uh, uh, in a minute or so about 
where you think this is all going to go and how, how can we actually make lasting change? As you said before, it's not going to happen overnight. We all know that. Um, and we've talked about putting uh, African-Americans, Black people inside the institutions, not just on the stage, in the pit and in the offices and in the boardroom and in, in the, where the money comes from. Um, what does all that look like? How, how, what can we expect? How do we get there? I think that we have to examine our hearts and our minds first. I think that before we can make those changes, we have to look within ourselves and say, is this who we really want to be? Because many of the folks um, who are making decisions oftentimes harbor different feelings than what they present to the world. And I know because I have been in those conversations with them. And so after we have that moment, I think that we really have to ask ourselves, do we really want every opera company in the United States that's big enough budget to be so and hire folks to be owned by white people? Do we want the only people who have a voice to just be the folks who have continued to have a voice and who have basically oversaw essentially the system we currently have inherited. Um, and so I guess where I'm going here is that I believe that change looks like each and every one of us doing it and contributing in the way that we can contribute, right? Um, and I think that we have to continue to have an all court press, right? It's not just me. It's not just Camille or just Vince or John or Bill or Joel or Leah. It's everybody doing it as every single part and holding every institution accountable, supporting black businesses, black ownership is absolutely important and essential. Make the playing field even when you have made it literally impossible for black business owners to even come into the field of publishing, owning a company, being in these positions, right? And so um, I'm hoping that uh, opportunities like the Black Music Matters Summit um, will continue to proliferate and give information to the public about what we can do about it and what we can do to make our spaces not just equitable in representation, but literally safe and pro-Black as opposed to continuing the narrative of anti-Black that we have inherited since the beginning of this country. Right. So I think when we distill it all down, it's, it's, we have to do it together. We have to find a way to make it all happen together. Uh, and that is a theme that is going through uh, all this year, at least in Governor State University, all the presentations that we do is this, this theme of we're not, we can't do it alone. We have to be together in this. And you drive that point home. Vince and Adrian and John and Camille, and Joel and Leah and Bill, I can't thank you enough for your insight and your expertise um, uh, being here today and talking with us. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to have uh, some information posted, uh, Black Music Matters Summit, uh, links to performances if you all have information that you want people to see, certainly links to articles that I've read and books that I've read. Naomi Andre's books are a fantastic place to start. Educate yourself. I'm, I'm speaking to the, my white colleagues. Educate yourselves. Open up your minds. Open up your hearts. Opera is more than Puccini and Verdi. Those are the shows that bring the people to the house to put the butts in the seats, but only because that's what we've known. And I think once we start to learn about new people and new music, uh, opera doesn't have to be such a narrow definition. And I think that would be best for everybody. And with that, I wanna say thank you and uh, best wishes to you all. Thank you again for this great conversation. No.